Welcome those of you that are joining us online this morning. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. It's good to see everybody out. We are starting our service a little differently today. So you can go back and sit down again. This morning, I'm going to kind of kick off um, my message today. We're actually starting uh, right now. And uh, the reason we're doing that is because I have a couple ladies with me this morning, Olga and, Olga and Cindy. So give them a big round of applause. They're, they're helping me today. We are starting a cooking show. We're live this morning. Hey, you talk about attracting visitors. Yeah, we're trying something new here. We have a cooking church. Yeah. So this morning, they're going to be helping me uh, with an illustration. And uh, as we go along today, you're going to understand a little bit more. But if you know, if you remember, we've been talking about the kingdom of God and how its effect is in the world around us and its effect on us. And if you have your Bible... If not, you can look on the overhead. just want to share a scripture with you this morning. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 13. And uh, we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God and how it works in our world. So I'm going to have the ladies just start doing what they're doing. And you guys will catch on in a little bit what we're talking about. Well, today is the sixth and the final uh, part in my series called God's Master Plan. God's master plan. We've been focusing our attention on the core, the core message of Jesus. What was at his heart when he came to this world and what was the burden, the passion. Wherever he went and everything that he talked about, he built around this one theme. Who knows what that theme was? But remember, we've talked about what? The kingdom of God. He said, I've got to go. Because I've got to go tell people in this other town, in this village, about the kingdom of God. So when you hear the term the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in the Bible, they're actually interchangeable. And uh, there's a lot of reasons uh, around that. But just so you know, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, they are the same thing. Jesus said the kingdom of God, when he showed up, he said it's not far away. He said, as a matter of fact, it's here now. It's something that the Jews were looking for for centuries. When Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is now. So how many of you have figured out by now that the kingdom of God was with Jesus? The kingdom of God was not some magical cloud that just showed up somewhere. And when Jesus came, he had to hunt for this cloud and meet it. Jesus was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was with him. The very things of heaven were with Jesus while he was on earth. And if you remember last week, I showed you an image. I showed you an image of how the old and broken creation of sin and death was gradually being replaced with the new creation that was birthed through the resurrection of Jesus. So many people have a misunderstanding of the transition that is occurring. This process of change happens in you and I first. Anytime somebody comes into union with Christ, and that's a word that I want you to think about today. When we come into union with Christ, something happens in us. When we come into union with Christ through faith, In the new birth, you become, the Bible says, a new creation. The Apostle Paul says, therefore, if anybody be in Christ, they are a new creation. And the kingdom of God has come upon them, and the kingdom of God is in them, and it goes with them wherever they go. That means if we are in Christ, and He is in us, and with us, then what does that mean where the kingdom of God is? It's with you. As you see from our image that we talked about last week, that we are living in what has been called the old, from the old to the new, we are living in the now and the not yet. We're living in the now and the not yet. This is why some days that you wake up, you're happy, 
and the world is great. And then the next day you wake up and you're not happy and the world is not great. How many of us have experienced that? Because we as children of God, we're living in the now and the not yet. We are constantly in the process of change and renewal. Just like a child who is going through growth pains. How many of you have had children that go through growth pains? How many of you remember that growing up? All right, what, why do they have growth pains? Because their body is changing. They're growing. You and I have growth pains. We go through that in our lives. So your spirit, once you're born again, is a new creation. But your soul, the mind, the will, and the emotion, and your flesh are connected to the old way in the old creation. But hey, think about this. They are being transformed as I speak. Your person, you, are being transformed right now this morning, even though you may not see it, transformation is occurring. Our new eternal body is going to be resurrected. Our new body is going to be resurrected in that final day at the end. We will become like Jesus our bodies will be eternal and our bodies will be natural, physical. But like Jesus, he said, touch him and feel him when he was resurrected. He had a living body. He could eat, he could touch, he could feel just like you and I could, but his body was no longer going to suffer decay. His body was no longer going to um, die. So let's read our text this morning and listen to what Jesus said. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13, <clears throat> Jesus said, And he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid three measures of flour in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. And you can read the same parable in Luke chapter 3. This morning we are going to talk about the growth process of the kingdom of God that we see in these two parables. One is seed and the other is, anybody figured it out by now? Yeast. All right. In the message that I've titled, The Kingdom, Seeds, and Yeast. I think most of us understand the growth process of plants that Jesus used agriculture all the time in his parables when he talked. He talked about seeds, he talked about plants, he talked about trees, branches, fruit, as metaphors for the kingdom of God. And he said, if you don't understand this process, you're not going to understand all the other parables are basically, he's saying, if you don't understand how this process of the kingdom works, you're going to misinterpret all kinds of things that are happening in your life and you're not going to understand. And as a matter of fact, he said this in Mark chapter four, Jesus said, and he said unto his disciples, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Think about that. So in other words, if you don't understand how the kingdom works, you're going to misinterpret how everything else works also. So we have to see God's plan through the kingdom view. So this morning I'm going to be talking about yeast and its connection to understanding the kingdom process. So Olga and Cindy are up here working. They are working. What are they doing? They're making bread. They've taken what? What did they put in the dough? They put in, they put in the dough. They put yeast inside of the dough, and they are mixing it all together. And bless their heart, they are just working away. So it's interesting, and we're going to begin to look at some of the connections of how yeast affects the dough and produces the, ble the bread that you and I have. So they take yeast, you mix it with flour, you mix water in it, you mix a number of different things in it. And what do you do once you've mixed it all in? What do you do? You leave it alone. You leave it alone. And you know, it's interesting, 
even in this process, she is needing it and she is pounding it. And sometimes when you watch people do this, they're pounding on it and they're kneading it and they're squeezing it together. And you and I need to understand some of the trials that we go through in life are like this dough in the process of change. So when we have challenges and trials in life, maybe, just maybe, those challenges and trials are part of the kneading process to get the yeast to spread through all of the dough and create something good and wonderful in you. So give the ladies a hand this morning. <clears throat> we are going to watch the process of what happens when you add yeast to the flour and you mix it up. We're going to see as the service goes on today what happens to the dough. All right, so let's stand together and invite the worship team up. And uh, we will continue our worship service, and I will be up uh, to continue this message in just a moment. So encourage our worship team. Good morning. Count on. You never leave us. Anytime we need to talk, you're there. Thank you for that today. We pray today that you would open our hearts and our minds to understand the Word of God more fully and more deeply so that we can become more acquainted with who you are, that we can know who you are relationally because you're our friend, but we want to be friends to you. We just thank you, Lord. We're opening up our hearts and our minds today to hear with spiritual ears what you have to share with us today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, give God some praise today. Tell him thank you. Amen. Always enjoy our worship team. Give them another big round of applause. We appreciate them. It's fun. Good to see you today. Those of you that are joining us for the first time, thank you for being here today. We always have a gift for our newcomers here this morning. So if you are a newcomer, don't forget immediately following the service, we have a gift for you um, just as a way of showing thank you for being with us. Also, if you've been here a second time, if you've been here for a third time, you just fill out one of the communication cards and uh, right back in the entryway there, you'll see it. Drop that in the tithe box there. And let us know about you. We have something special we want to send to you. So promise we won't sell your name to some mailing list or anything like that. All right. One announcement today. We have baptism after service this morning um, at 12 o'clock. Those of you who have never made that decision to be baptized, come out. It's not too late. You know what? The Bible doesn't say, hey, let me think about it. I'll do this, that. No, Jesus just said, do it. Go, go. If you are serious about following Christ and you have never been baptized, come and do it. It's, you know, it really, nobody holds you under that long. <clears throat> I promise, you know, it just depends. I mean, if you're married and your wife says, can you hold him under longer? Yeah, we can, we can do that. But no, come on out. I mean, it's just Jesus did it. And the Bible tells us that if we want to follow Jesus, let's do what he does. And he did that as an example for us. So come on out and be a part of the Ebony questions. You can see Tina, raise your hand back there, Tina, or come see me and I'll point you in the right direction. All right, well, let's continue this morning. Get your Bible out. We'll reread our passage this morning in Matthew chapter 13. And we've been looking... Um, at the parables of Jesus, one that we talked about last week, the parable of Jesus and the tares and the wheat, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end, so anyway, keep your finger on that one too, but, um, and this is what he said, he said, he told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven or yeast that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. You know, three, think about that. It says in three measures of flour. If you go into the modern translations, you know how much that is? 
60 pounds. 60 pounds of flour. 60 pounds. So in other words, it, it's a little bit of leaven or yeast to produce a lot. And they said in one translation is so that the, the leaven would produce many loaves of bread. So it's not just enough to, to take care of you. It's enough, the Bible says, till your cup overflows and can bless people around you. Why is understanding the process of leaven or yeast so important to us understanding God's master plan? See, people right now on the earth, any person that, that has an open heart to understand what is going on in the world, they want to know what's going on in the world from the beginning to the end. Everybody wants to know, okay, here's the, we all know the beginning. Everybody wants to know, what about the end? There's a, there is an infatuation in our world with the end, right? How many of you ever, you know, watch a movie and there's some sort of cataclysmic event that's going on and the producers of the movie never fail to have somebody standing there with some banner or a sign that says the, what? The end is near, okay? Everybody wants to know that. Well, how does this process work? What does... All of God's master plan, how does it work? How does it flow out? And that's what we've been kind of looking at. So what is yeast or leaven? In actuality, they're not the same thing. But for my example today, we're going to assume that they are. Yeast and leaven are a little different in their historic uh, significance. But today, they're, we're going to talk about them as the same. So either way, it's something very small or hidden to the naked eye, but causes growth and affects the whole. If you didn't know, yeast is actually a fungus. I didn't know that. It tells you all these years. I never even thought about it. Yeast is actually a fungus. I'm sure you wanted to know that when you're eating bread, you're eating fungus. But when used properly, it works subtly to change the whole. I read one definition about yeast, and it said this. This is their definition, not mine. Okay, I didn't make this up. This was actually a definition of how, how yeast works. It says, yeast causes farting in the bread. Okay, yeast causes farting. I just had to say that multiple times. I, our pastor was talking about farting at church. Yeah. So yeast causes farting in the bread to produce gas. That expands the bread to cause it to rise. So there's some value. Never mind. I'm not kidding. Okay, here's an example. Leaven in the Bible. No, never mind. Go back. Some Bible commentators have suggested that leaven is a bad thing that is a symbol of sin and corruption. They say it's always bad. Here's an example. Leaven in the Bible, one guy said, without exception, is used as a symbol of corruption by unclean or sinful things. Which I have heard that. I read one example they use. It says, when the people of Israel were coming out of Egypt, God told them to remove all the leaven from the house. Well, why did God require them to get rid of all the leaven from the house before they left Egypt? So that's a question. I just, I just kind of had a thought. Um, something to consider. And this is kind of my thought because I'm thinking, okay, well, because it was Egypt's leaven that had to be removed from their midst before they could leave. This leaven that they had was a symbol of Egypt's culture, religious practices, and what they considered to be the good life that they were living in. God did not want them to bring any of that way of life with them that could be used to tempt them to return to Egypt. And when you think about it, he didn't want them to take any leaven bread as a starter because leaven, look it up. When you look up leaven in its historic uh, uh, description in the Bible or in history, it will tell you leaven is actually some sort of part of sourdough that is used as a starter for other bread. So God did not want them taking anything of Egypt to start their new life. Interesting. Interesting. Interesting to note, when they finally did come to the land of Canaan as conquerors, they were required 
to eat leavened bread and offer it as a peace offering to the Lord. So God wanted them to eat leavened bread. So in reality, when you think about it, leaven or yeast is actually a neutral metaphor. It's neutral. There's nothing inherently negative about the symbolism of leaven or yeast anywhere in Scripture. The use of leaven as a symbol depends on the context. So the writers are telling us, don't let certain things in your life, and they're using yeast or leaven as an example. Jesus compared the kingdom of God to leaven. Surely he's not casting negativity on the kingdom of God. Why did he use leaven as an example? Why did Jesus use leaven or yeast as an example? In your handout, I gave you a little fill-in spot there. and Write this down. It says, yeast or leaven is a symbol of time, continuity, and dominion. Remember, we've talked about God's purpose for humanity. God created humanity. In Genesis, it tells us God gave man dominion. He created this earthly being from the natural earth, the, the, the elements of the earth. He took of the elements of the earth. He created a physical body, and then he deposited in it a spirit. And the spirit was, was he, from heaven, and the natural body is of the earth. So what did he do? He created a being that actually represented heaven while on earth. So we became this amazing created being that was part heaven and part earth. What does he want us to learn through all of this? Think about it. We understand the words time. We probably understand the word dominion because we've talked about that. Dominion is something that just means that you have control or power over something, your, your domain we understand dominion, but continuity. What is continuity? Continuity, according to the dictionary, means the unbroken and consistent existence or operation of something over a period of time. Unbroken and consistent existence or operation of something over a period of time. So in other words, if you just... Put this, let this thing be in there for a period of time. Over a period of time, it is going to produce something. So in other words, continuity is the fact that something continues to happen or exist, whether you see it or not, with no great changes or interruptions. So it's going to continue. In other words, like you and I, no matter what happens, you and I are an eternal being. We are an eternal being. No matter what happens in this world, all the challenges we go through, we, are, we, we have uh, continuity. No matter what, we are on a road. We are on a road that started one day when we were born, and we are on a road that is heading somewhere eternally. So there's no break in that continuity. It continues. Challenges happen in life. All these different things go on. But you are still an eternal being that's heading in a particular direction, and that's the kingdom. In this parable, Jesus connected yeast or leaven with seeds. So in other words, we could say, what seeds you sow like leaven or yeast, over time they will grow and affect the whole. See, now how do you see that? Immediately somebody thinks about that in a negative. Oh, Negatively. Well, don't think of it as a negative. Some people see it positively. Some people are kind of a glass half full or half empty kind of person. What are you? Are you a half full person or a half empty person? Right? How, how, do, you, how do you see the world? It's either positive or negative. So in other words, if you, if you allow, if you sow or allow a seed, a thought or an idea into your mind or heart, it will, over time, influence all of your decisions and how you see the world. It will, won't it? Over time, it's going to influence it. So in other words, whatever you embrace, whatever thinking, philosophy, ideology, whatever you embrace in your thinking, you're going to start influencing your decisions. Look at our world around us. 
Seeds have been sown in a particular generation, and now it's influencing every decision that they make. We see it happening all the time. So, and it's funny, the devil, he's, he's okay with that. So sow a seed, walk away, leave it, let it do its work unless you recognize the seed. That's the challenge with seeds or yeast, is that it's hidden. You don't even notice it. This morning when the ladies were up here making the, the, the bread, they were mixing the flour and the yeast and the water and all these things together. Nobody saw the yeast. Maybe you saw it in the beginning, but once it got put into the bread, that's it. It's in there. So with this in mind, think about it. anything you let into your life, positive or negative, will through time and continuity have dominion in your life. What do you want to have dominion in your life? The Bible says that God gave us dominion over the earth. But many times the earth is dominating us. We are being controlled by the things of this world. When in actuality God says no. So what's Jesus' goal? Jesus came in. I find very fascinating. He showed up on the scene. He was full of the Spirit of God, full of the kingdom of God, and he interrupted the natural order of things on the earth. He had power to interrupt the natural order of things on earth. A storm was going on. Jesus just stood up and spoke to the storm, and he interrupted the natural elements of the world. He walked on water. He did crazy stuff that you and I look at. Well, why? Because he had dominion over it. it. Wasn't some magic. The Bible says God gave him dominion. He walked in that dominion. He had dominion over the powers of darkness. He had the dominion over everything. He walked as a new man, as a new created being, in dominion of the things God had given him. So, depends what do you want to have dominion in your life. Jesus warned his disciples many times to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What was he warning them about? He was warning them about their teaching. About the things that they said. Because those things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were teaching were contrary to what Jesus was teaching. So, here's an important thing for you. How many of you question what people say? What guys on TV, whatever pastor, preacher, whoever, me? Yes, question it. I, you know, people, oh, don't question the pastor. Oh, absolutely. You should. Because if you don't, if you don't challenge or question what I'm teaching you or look into the Bible for yourself, then you can be easily led astray then I'm not doing my job. See, my job is not to teach you what to think. It's to teach you what? How to think. Okay? Can I read your Bible for you? No. That's your job. My job is to challenge you to read it. My job is to challenge you to become the person God has, has created you to be. I'm not here to do the work for you. I'm to challenge you to do it. So in our case this morning, we're talking about what? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like leaven or yeast. So true Christianity is the yeast and it has a leavening effect on the ungodly culture of the world around us. The kingdom of God permeates the whole of the culture. And guess what? It can't be stopped. The devil wants you to think that it can be stopped. It cannot be stopped. The power of God cannot be stopped. It can be slowed. It can be shot off course. Why? Because the kingdom of God works with humanity. It works within you. Over time, it'll cause, I believe it will cause the whole of the culture to rise and become what God created us to be. The Apostle Paul said that in the book of Romans. The creation is waiting for that to happen. So you can save creation. 
Every time I look at my dogs, my animals, they, I, they look at me with these funny eyes. And how many of you ever have animals that do they look at you funny? And I, I think they're looking at me and saying, can you please hurry up? Take your dominion. Be who God told you to be. Get me out of this state that I'm in. Right? They don't like living in suffering. They don't like living in negative conditions in life. That's not the way God created it to be. Every created thing suffers because of what humanity has done. Well, every created thing can be blessed for what humanity has done and what humanity continues to do. Just like our example last week, the kingdom of God and the new creation are here and it is gradually moving in in time, it will overcome all the powers of darkness and the Bible tells us even one day it will overcome finally death itself. Death itself will be removed, the Bible said. Jesus said that's the last enemy that will be destroyed, will be removed, is death itself. We will never suffer death again. There's nothing more powerful, listen, there is nothing more powerful than leaven or yeast of the kingdom of God. Nothing. You and I are here today because we've been affected by it. We allowed yeast to come into our life of the kingdom of God and it's changed us. How many of you agree with that? It changed you. Jesus himself prayed this prayer. Think about it. Oh, let me go back though. The bread that is produced by the leaven of the kingdom, the Bible says, is the preferred bread. Think about it. For centuries, bread has been the staple and the symbol of life. It was the source of of all humanity's nutrition. That's what we wanted was bread. Jesus himself prayed, give us this day our daily unleavened bread. No, what did he pray? Give us this day our daily bread. He wanted you to have the good stuff. Jesus came to give you the good stuff. He didn't come to give you the bad stuff. He says there's an enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you what? Have life and have it more abundant. Tell your neighbor, he meant for me to have a good life. You know, people think there's this weird thinking that, that oh yeah, well, you, you know, you're not really, really a Christian unless you suffer a lot. Well, I'm not saying suffering isn't part of life. But I guarantee you from the beginning, that's not God's plan to make us suffer. It's part of what happens right now. There's a reason for it. God uses it. But that's not the way God designed it for you and I to live our lives. I don't know about you, but when I want some good bread, I'm not hunting for unleavened bread. Right? No. We want, we want the good stuff. So the kingdom of God makes life a joy for humanity. It's a joy for humanity. It brings the very best of God with it. We may not understand how the process of leaven or yeast works in the door. Maybe not understand, the Bible says, how seeds work. But the Bible says that we see it so in the ground. It says the farmer goes out, and night and day he sleeps, and it just comes up. It does its job. See, you and I trust in the power of the kingdom of God. We don't know how it works, but we do know. Um, given the sufficient amount of times, it works to produce the bread that you and I want. In the ancient world, leaven or yeast was used as a symbol. This is interesting. In the Greek world, leaven or yeast was used as a symbol of the incarnation, the resurrection, the new life, and the new creation. Bread was a symbol of the new creation. So leaven is the life of the bread. We could have two examples up here, one with leaven and one without leaven, and you would see one with, without leaven would do, what would it be doing? Nothing. Nothing. But if you have leaven or, or yeast in the other one, what's it doing? It's growing. It's actually doing something inside of it. Jesus made it very, very clear, and as we have seen, that God's plan from the beginning was for heaven the yeast to once again invade the earth, the dough, and they would become one. 
From the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught His disciples to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done, what? On earth as it is in heaven. So He wanted them to join together. Jesus Himself, think about this, Jesus Himself was hidden like yeast on the earth at His birth. He was an example of leaven. He was born into obscurity in the middle of nowhere, hidden like yeast on the earth somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Into a small, seemingly insignificant life that grew to influence and change the world. You and I are just like Him. You and I are also like Jesus. We too are the yeast or the leaven of the kingdom and our lives over time will influence and change the lives of other people. You, look at your neighbor and say, I am good leaven of the world. One thing that I've noticed as I've read um, through the Bible and the story of humanity is that it's never God who is the hindrance to the growth of the kingdom. It's never God. Or the process, or the spread, or the advancement. It's always an enemy, it's the devil, or it's human beings themselves who are trying to stop the process of God's kingdom and His advancement in the world. You and I are the issue. Yes, the devil comes, but he uses human beings to interfere with God's plan. If we cooperate with what God is doing, it will change the world. You know, it's interesting, also, speaking of leaven, there's been some discussion um, through the years over communion as to whether or not we should be using unleavened bread or leavened bread. Go, Go online, it's fascinating. There are lots of very dedicated Christian people who believe that we shouldn't be using unleavened bread because that speaks of what we need to let go of and of the past. And eating the regular leavened bread speaks of new creation, the future, and the present life that God has given us in abundance. Interesting. I'm not here to decide one way or the other. So if you come in and you've got a big loaf of bread, you go right ahead and eat it. All right? But I said it was interesting. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 12, as we come to our conclusion here this morning, I want you to put some trust in what God says. God doesn't interrupt the process. God doesn't interrupt the process. That is what we've learned. The kingdom of God, the seed of God is sown. God plants the yeast in there. You cannot separate the yeast from the dough. It's a process. It grows through the course of time. We even found out last week that the tares and the wheat grow together. Are we supposed to try to tear it apart? No, that's God's job. He's the one that deals with it, whether you believe whatever your particular viewpoints are, but it's God. We can't do it. We're not the tear police, okay? We're not the unleavened yeast police, we're, we're, we're not that. We are, our job is to take the Word of God, communicate it to the world, and let the, the kingdom of God do its work. And listen to what God said. And, the, and Jeremiah said, The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is what? Fulfilled. So God's word is powerful. It is going to be fulfilled in your life. So let's check out our flower and see what happened here. Holy smoke. So our, our flower's grown. Our flower has made some progress over time. And it's farting. Sorry, just had to throw that in there. Um, and I found out also, did you know that, that bread rises three times? Interesting. Interesting. When you think about how the kingdom of God works, you can get beat down a little bit, but you rise again. 
The righteous fall seven times, but guess what? We don't stay down. We get back up because the kingdom of God, that's how the kingdom of God works. So I want to end this morning with the same challenge that I started the series with and started even this week with. And my challenge to all of us is this, has been for you to see the human story, your story, through the filter of the kingdom concept or idea as you read the Bible. Read the Bible through the filter of the kingdom, of that perspective, and see yourself as an agent of the new creation, bringing change and renewal and transformation to the world around you as you share the message of Jesus with others. When you go to your job tomorrow, if you wonder what purpose do I have at my work, you are a new creation agent bringing transformation to the people at your work. Why? Because the kingdom of God is with you. Well, you go, I don't feel it. Well, the yeast. The job of what the kingdom is, the word of God. You are an agent. You're like that dough. The kingdom of God, the seeds of the kingdom of God, the yeast of the kingdom of God is sown inside of you in your spirit. And it is transforming the world around you. And finally, one more thing today. I want to I wanna challenge you. You know, in our world today, as I said in the beginning, there is really an infatuation with the end. What happens in the end? What does the Bible say about it? We have God's master plan in the beginning. How does the human story come to an end in this world? What happens? A lot of different views there. A lot of different ideas about it. It's funny, people ask me all the time, well, what do you believe? What do you believe? Well, I can tell you this, my viewpoints have changed over the years since I have read the Bible many, many times now. What I grew up in, in that particular viewpoint, which we call eschatology. Anybody ever heard that? Okay, if you haven't, you, you need to look it up. Um, eschatology, if you just Google it, you can probably just type it and it'll come up. It's the study of end times. It's something that people have been studying for centuries and centuries and centuries to figure out what is God saying about the end. So because of that, there's all these viewpoints, and it's called eschatological views. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you today. Next Sunday, I'm going to have, I'm going to print off all of the viewpoints that are out there. Did you know there's more than one? Okay, I grew up in a church and I thought my, the, the view we had growing up was the only view that was there. And then I started getting around other Christians and they started telling me stuff and I thought they were like psychos. Oh my God, you don't believe what I believe? What? This, what? Well, here's the challenge. Most people, most people, if you ask them what do they believe, they'll tell you what they believe and then if you ask them, well, where does the Bible say that? They don't even know where to look in the Bible to say it. Prove it. Why? Because they're believing what somebody else has said instead of for themselves. Study the Bible for yourself. Isn't that what the Scripture tells us to do? Study to show yourself approved. You study the Word of God. People ask me all the time, I'm not going to tell them what I believe. You want to know why I'm not going to tell them? It, not that it doesn't matter, but I don't want you using me like people have used everybody else. Well, so-and-so says, so-and-so says, and this person says, and that person says, no, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible tell you to do? So next week I'm going to have a list, and I want you to study it for you. Look at your neighbor and say you. Study it for you. I'm going to give you the multiple viewpoints. You can study it. It's actually pretty fascinating. It's very, very fascinating to study the other viewpoints and what people think. And they, trust me, there's theologians out there that have been looking at this for years and years and years. And it's very, very interesting. So if you don't know how the end is going to happen, well, then welcome to the world. Because there's not a whole lot of people that know how the whole thing falls out. But we do have a little bit. The scripture does give us some ideas, tells us how it's going to work. And once you learn this, it's going to give you some peace. 
where that way when you see something come on, the eclipse craziness that happens, you know, all of that kind of stuff shows up all over the, your uh, social media and all this stuff, you'll, you'll just go, yeah, okay. And you'll just keep preaching the gospel to people and let the kingdom of God flourish. Can you say amen? amen. All right, let's stand together today. I do want to remind you this morning that if you're here this morning and you need prayer or you have any questions about yourself and your spiritual life and your destiny or anything like that, please come up. We have people here that are going to be available for you to pray for you. There's a need going on in your life. There's a challenge you're facing and you just need somebody to stand and pray with you. They'll be up here and available for you this morning. So don't leave um, the same way you came in. Once again, thank you for being with us today. God bless you. It's always a blessing to be a part of uh, Southgate Church. I love you all. I love being here. So God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the joy that you have given us in our relationship with you. I do continue to pray for people that their hearts be stirred and that they, they would go into your word and search it Lord, for themselves, because I know that's what changes us. And I just ask you, Father, for you to continue to bless them, watch over them in their work, and all that they do throughout this week. We thank you for those that are made that decision to be baptized today. We thank you, Lord, for I know it's boldness in them to make that decision, and we are here to celebrate their new beginning. And we give you praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so those of you that are being baptized, get ready, head on over to uh, the Taurus place. If you need an address or anything, let me know. We'll direct you there, and if not, we'll see you again next week. Amen.